Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. So um, today we're going to cover data manipulation part two. It's a continuation of the, the other session we had last month from Naomi. So yeah, it's a little bit advanced, just a little bit, and we'll be building on top of what Naomi presented last time. So we'll cover the following topics. The, the flow is slightly different from what was presented, but we'll cover everything. So the first thing is we'll cover appending, how to append data in R, and then introduction to data manipulation, introduction to string manipulation, merging data, then reshaping data. So yeah, feel free to share any questions that you have on the chat um, concerning all the things that we'll go through today. So I'll jump, I'll jump right into walking you through the script. Um, the first thing, I hope you guys have had a chance to download the script, but if you can, um, if you can just uh, focus on this as we run through it, and then you can also try it from your end. So yeah, the first thing, um, this is an R markdown file. Uh, yeah, I think Naomi covered it last time but I'll just go through it slightly again. So uh, the basics of an R markdown file, you have the title, which is the title of your analysis. You have the author, um, a date, and the kind of, like when you, you can need a markdown file. So what's the output that you get? You'll get a HTML file. So these are chunks. And in, uh, in between the chunks of, the chunks that we have, that is where you write your code. So the first thing um, that I've done is um, it's good programming practice to always remove, or if you want to remove everything that is in memory when you're starting out a new project. So that is what I've done. This code removes everything that is in my memory. I've already removed it, so there's nothing to remove from my end. But if you run it, if there were, assuming there was a variable called A, sorry, um, and it had uh, my name <laughs> called uh, it had Tina. So assuming when I opened our studio, this is what I got. Sometimes you you get um, objects that remain in memory for some reason. So if you want um, to remove this a to remove everything, this code removes everything. This is removed, and then ls is everything that is in a, on your memory. So if I run this, it will remove Tina and I'll have a blank working space. And that's, that's good practice. So as was previously shared, um, the libraries that we'll use today will be Tidyverse, which uh, encompasses other packages underneath it. It has Deplier, um, TidyR. So if you install this, you're good. Um, we also need Lubricate. I'm sorry, I don't think this was included, but um, it's useful. If you can install it, that's fine. And read Excel. So read Excel um, comes with Tidyverse, but you have to exclusively um, call it yeah, when you're loading the libraries. So these are the three libraries that we'll use today. So yeah, at this point, um, we are loading these libraries into memory. And then the next thing is we set our working directory. Um, your working directory should be the path up to where your working folder is. So if you've created a folder on your desktop, for example, it will be users, maybe your name, and then desktop, then your folder. So your working, um, your working directory should be the path up to your current folder for this project. Okay, so if I run this, um, it will load all these libraries and set my working directory. Okay, so let's jump right into it. So um, the data sets that we'll be using today for training, it will be the same data set that Naomi used last time. Even if you weren't there last, last time, um, it's a data set on Kenyan accidents. Um, you can get this on the EDX platform. It's free. You can just download it from there. It's the same data set I'm using. So this is what you're using today. And for today's session, um, we'll be reading two sheets. That data sheet, 
that data file has two sheets. It's an Excel file. So it has the first sheet, I think um, the database of accidents in 2016, and the second sheet, which is the database on, of accidents in 2017. So first thing, when you're reading in data and you want to read in different sheets from Excel, that's an excel -S file. So if you want to do that, at this point, um, we use this function called read underscore Excel. And then when you're, um, when I'm declaring the file name, I don't have to put the whole path because I had already defined a working directory up here. So I just put a dot, which means I'm telling R in the current folder, pick this file. And then the sheet name, which is comma sheet equals one. This is the first sheet. So I'm reading the first sheet. And then the next line is when you're reading the second sheet. The only difference between this and this sorry, is uh, at this sheet argument, the first one we are reading the first sheet, and the second one we are reading the second sheet. So if I run this, you run a chunk from this point, I don't think I mentioned that, this is the run button. So if I run it, we'll get, uh, we will get um, DF1 and DF2. DF1, let me just click on it and do it real quick, is the sheet from the first, is the data file from the first sheet, which has um, all these variables. We'll go, um, we'll walk through them in a minute. And then the second file is the data sheet from the second sheet. So as you can see, yeah, it has quite a number of variables. So if you just want to, browse um, your data file, which is like, I think, um, very common practice. Like, yeah, you can click, if you click on it, you can view, how do I minimize this? Gosh. Um, sorry. Give me a minute. How do I minimize this? <laughs> I don't know if you can see my screen. Okay. okay, so, sorry. If you want to view it, you click on the file and you see all the variables that you have on this file and the other one. And when you look at your console down here, um, my studio has been, I think, shifted a little bit. Um, I think the console to the default R Studio is on the top right, if I'm not wrong. So if you look at your console, you see um, once we clicked onto this, it has another way of viewing your file is view DF1 and view DF2. You can just use a function instead of clicking here, it's the same thing. Yes, okay. So let's move forward. The first thing that we mentioned, now that we have our data set, the first thing that we want to learn today is appending data. And what do we mean by appending data? Appending data simply means um, you want to add rows of one data frame onto another data frame. So assuming we have DF1 and DF2, these are two data frames they should have the same information. We can look at the variables that we have. If you look at the, the variables that are in DF1, we can do names DF1. You see it has time, uh, 24 hours, the county that the accident happened, the road, the place that the accident happened, um, some details on what happened in the accident, the gender, age, etc. So we want to append DF1 two to df1 we want to add rows together so if i look at the variables that are in df2 we'll see that they have almost a hundred percent like similar variables but df2 has more variables than df1 um df2 has i think 14 and df1 has 30, has 12, sorry. So um, it's important to note that um, when you are appending variables, you must first identify 
um, do they have similar do they have similar variable names? So if you're looking, you want to append two data sets, and for example, here we want county and county, you can see that how county is named here is the same as how county is named here, right? And how time in 24 hours is named here is the same thing as how it's named here. So that's really important when you are appending the same variable together. But something to note is that you don't have to have the same number of variables in DF1 um, between one data frame and the other one. Because you can see in DF1, we have 12 variables and in DF2, we have 14 variables and that's okay. Um, if you have different number of variables, um, as long as you understand why they are different, that's fine. So the function that we're going to learn today, this is a declare function, it's bind underscore rows. And it will help us to bind rows because when we are appending data, we are binding rows together. So the first argument is the first data frame name, which is DF1. And the second argument is the second data frame, which is DF2. The third argument, this is not so important. You don't need it, but I like it because it helps you to identify which rows have come from DF1 and which rows have come from DF2. So if we are to run this line, um, we'd have one big data set that has all the rows from both DF1 and DF2. So if I run this, um, we'll, you'll see another data file created called appended um, underscore DF. So I, as I mentioned before, one way of viewing a file is you can click on this file or another way is you can type view and then the name of the file. So once you start typing, our studio will start giving you um, potential options and you'd see it's appended DF that you want to view. So if I click on that, you can view the file. If I look at the total number of observations of appended underscore DF, we have 1118. If you add this plus this, you get 1118 observations. But if you see um, the total number of variables, right now we have 15. So why do we have 15? We have 15 because when we append two data files and we have some variables that are in DF2, like, um, like victim is in DF2 but is not in DF1, all the variables will be maintained. But the only difference is that this variable for the data points that came from DF1 will have missing, right? So the reason why um, we have 15 variables is because when it's appending, it has maintained 14 variables. And the 15th one is the ID variable, this one that we defined at this point. So if you come here, we'll see a column called DFs. This is the ID variable we defined. And then if I scroll through it, so we have under DF, we have um, one and two. So that I know rows that have one came from the first DF and rows that have two came from the second DF. Um, yeah, so looking at something called uh, the variable called victim we know victim is only in df2 and not in df1 so we are expecting um for no 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 not victim sorry victim is in both variables both data sets um the column that are not in both are MV involved, actually. Sorry, victim is in both. So if you look for MV involved, let's just look for it real quick. Yep. So for, for rows in DF1, the first data frame that we have, this one, we're expecting missing values for this, for MV involved and name of victim. But for the rows that are in DF2, we're expecting actual values. Uh, yeah. 
and here they are. Because in DF2 is where we had these variable names, right? But for all the other columns that were shared between DF1 and DF2, they will merge perfectly. So they will just be on top of each other, right? The same variable name will be maintained, like something like 10, 24 hours, but we are only adding rows underneath the rows of um, the first variable. So this is the end of the first DF, and then the second one, we're just adding rows underneath it. So that's um, generally appending data. So when you're appending data, you're just adding rows. Uh, Note, uh, so when you're using, we've said when you're using bind underscore rows, the number of um, variables doesn't have to be the same. But if they are similar variables, they need to have the same name. If they have different names, they, they won't append perfectly. They'll form two different column names. So you need to have the same name for bind underscore rows. And that's like that's it when it comes to binding rows it's just adding rows together and that's that so um i don't know if anyone has any question concerning that you can post it on the the, what, the message section and we'll be sure to answer that yeah so the second thing is we're going to learn something on date manipulation so many a times, the data, the data set that we have come with dates, dates of anything that has happened. But in this case, the data, the date variable that we have is in relation to the date that the actual accident happened. So when you encounter a date variable, there are so many things that you might want to do with that. In a normal like DS project or in a normal data project, you might want to find the number of occurrences per date or, or to extract the month or the year. So in this instance, we are going to learn how to extract different things from a date. We're going to learn how to extract a month, a year, a month with a label, um, yeah, a day of, day of month variable. <laughs> yeah, so that... Um, when you're summarizing your data or when you want to graph your data, it's very easy for you to get there. So the first thing that we do is we have um, a date variable called, if you look at this, um, date D D M M Y Y. So for this date variable, I, I wanted to rename it. Let me just uh, go back a little bit. So we'll use some of the concepts that Naomi taught in the previous section uh, in data manipulation one. And one of the things are um, using piping. So this is called piping for those people who didn't attend. And what this simply means is um, when um, summarizing data on when I want to use declare functions, instead of writing individual lines, I can just write a code, then rename, then mutate, then do this, then do this. So this simply means like it's a continuation of what we have up here. So if I have a appended data set, then I do this. The output from here will be used here. The output from here will be used here. The output from here will be used down there. So this is what the piping, um, uh, what piping means this symbol and then um, renaming is a function in deplier and I want to rename a column the reason why I'm renaming a column is because we can leave it as is but I really wanted to give it another variable because of how it's structured so I wanted to give it another variable so the renaming function how it works is you have your, um, your data set, then rename new name equals to old name. So if I run this, I'll just run it section by section. I won't run the whole thing. You can run it up to this point. If I highlight this point and run it, um, if I browse appended DF, 
and go to that I no longer have, I'll no longer have the date DDMMYY. Instead, I'll have this because I've renamed it to date underscore variable. And if you look at the date variable, how it's structured is we have the year, then month, sorry, then day. So what we have we want to do next is we want to extract the year. We want to generate a variable that will have our year only. Because um, the final aim, let me see, okay, let's take out the aim. But assuming you want to count the number of accidents in 2016 and the number of accidents versus the number of accidents in 2017. You cannot work with this variable as is, so you have to extract the year. So how you do it is you um, you use a function called year, and year will extract um, the year from this date variable. So let me just mention that this function, the function year, comes from the package called BlueGridit. Um, I hope you get a chance to download this package um, yeah so if you need to access this function you need you get it from lubricate so once you download it load download it from cran then load it into r so that you access this function so how i access the year function is mutate year is equals to year then my date variable if i run this i should be able Oh, sorry, we already renamed it. Okay. Let me just comment this out. So if I run this, I should be able to extract um, my year variable, my year from the date variable. So if I look at this, from the date variable, we have extracted the year, right? If you scroll down, we should get to 2017. Uh, sorry, yeah, so it's good. Um, it has extracted the year. Another thing that might be interesting um, to extract from this date is maybe the month, right? So the function that extracts um, a month from a date variable in Lubridate is the month function. So if I run up to this point, I go to my appended df and if I look at the month, it has extracted the month six. Um, another month four. Um, this is April. Yeah. So all the months that are found within our dates. Sorry, this is February for this date. So another thing is like when you're trying to eventually, I'm sure we learn how to create graphs in maybe Digiplot 2. When you want to work with visualizations, um, you can leave it as two, but sometimes you want to make it as intuitive as possible. So you want the actual label of the month. Because, okay, fine, it's easy to know two is February, but it's even easier when you have the actual label so that. Uh, so that when someone is looking at the visualization, it's very easy. So what I may want to do is I want a month, but with a label. I don't want number two, three, four, five. I want the month extracted with a label. So when I run this, let me just remove this for a minute. If I run this appended DF and view the month with the label, you'll see that now, we have a label, sort of a short, a truncated label, Feb, um, November, December. So if you want to visualize or tabulate, it's, it's nicer, at least from my perception, it's nicer to have this label. So you can use this variable for your summaries and for your graphs. But then maybe I don't want this, Seb, um, love. I want the full label. So what Lubridate has is for this function, we have um, 
this uh, another argument called abbreviation. So abbreviation equals to false means that we have we want the label. We don't want just novel fed. We have we want the whole name of the month. So when we run this and view, we'll see that instead of nov, so right now we have November, um, February. So we have like actual month uh, labels. And this comes in handy, again, as I've said, when you're displaying tables, regressions, whatever you want to do with your data, eventually um, you may want to use this and this is useful. So the last thing is when you want to extract the day. So right now we are dissecting this date variable, right? We've extracted the month, the year, we've extracted the month, we've extracted the month with a label. So right now we want to extract this last thing. Because remember, the structure of our date variable is year, month, day. So if you want to extract this, um, come back to your code, um, you want to mutate, mutate is generate a variable, the variable you're going to generate is day, and equals to a day function that is in blue braided, and then our date variable. So I must say this, I, I don't like naming variables with, um, with the same structure as a function because it's not good programming in practice. So let me just rename this to day, maybe day var. So right here, what we're saying is mutate a variable called day var equals to day. This is an actual function. And then this is the date variable. So if I run this, yeah, sorry, I run if I run this and browse, going back to this, I'll see that the day from this date um, column has been extracted, right? So assuming, um, the reason why we do all this cleaning is because um, definitely you have an end goal. So assuming our end goal at this point was to determine the month with the highest number of accidents. So we don't really care about the, the year that the accident happened, but we want to know like how accident occurrences vary um, between, in between months of the year. So if that was our aim, we'd come here and mutate month with the label, then extract the month. Then the next thing we'll do is how this month with the label variable will be useful is Let's just do a quick summary um, of that here. I left this empty chunk for that so that um, we have an idea of the end goal when we are cleaning data and when we are extracting things so that it's easier. So if I come here, my goal was to find uh, the number of months with the highest, no, the month with the highest number of accidents. So then we'll be summarizing data. I'll create an object that will hold my summarized data called maybe sum. And then with my sum, I'll take my appended df, this. Then I'm going to pipe today, sorry. So I won't use um, individual uh, lines. We are piping everything today. So we're saying take appended df, then we want to group by I think this was introduced last time, I believe. We want to group by month with label. Then we want to summarize. And what are we summarizing? We want to get the total count. Uh, and this, yep. Equals to this counts, this N open close bracket. It counts the number of occurrences um, of a given month with label. So if you run this, I'm just showing it here, and look at sum, this is, we place, remember we place everything we've summarized into this object. So if you look at this, you'll see our month with label and the total count. Today we're only doing total count. Um, I will calculate the percentage. So Feb, we can see we have 13 um, accident occurrences. In March, we have 144 and so on. So if this was your end goal, and remember, you only have 
this data set. Um, yeah, this data set, you've had this data set and you want to uh, summarize, you want to get the month with the highest number of um, accidents. Then how you do it is, you first have to extract the month, which is done at this point, then do your summary. Because if you try to do your summary as is, it's not possible because you have like actual dates here. So it will be very difficult um, to get the month with the highest number of accidents if, if that was your aim. Okay. So um, we have just done an introduction of dates. Um, this is just an intro of dates and how you might manipulate it. Um, we'll not get into the in-depth stuff, but I hope um, this can be a good intro to how you can deal with this when you get date variables in your data set. So yeah, I think that's it. I don't know if we have any questions on the chat up to this point. Maybe I can answer a few if we have. And if not, we can move forward. Because they we do okay, cool. Mm -hmm. No, we actually don't have any question on the chat, so we may proceed. Okay, 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 fine. Because the practice session is at the end. Oh, okay, so yeah, feel free to drop any questions that you have right there. So we are moving forward um, to introduction to string manipulation. And um, in this case, we're only going to do two things. Um, we're going to identify accidents that involve pedestrians, and we're going to clean the counting and validating bit. So string, what is a string? A string is um, like words. When you're reading in data into R, and then you get like um, words or letters, um, that is, like, that's the definition of a string in, in R or in programming. So how do you deal with strings? Because then um, strings are very inevitable in our data. They are there. And sometimes you need to summarize something based on a string, based on like words that were recorded somewhere. I know you, we are used to having data that has like actual numbers or actual categories of things that are well defined. Um, you can think of Kitui, something like this as a string, right? Moya, um, Nakuru, those are all strings. And the string that I want us to um, focus on or how um, this section will be useful when you're dealing with data is when people are recording actual things, like when they're recording how things happened or the opinion about things, the opinion about... Um, yeah, so when you go to a restaurant and you're told to review the place, how do they analyze your data? They have like raw reviews of people. So then how do you deal with raw reviews or raw strings and make them eventually summarize them in a way that can be displayed um, very well and in a way that is very compressed? So if you look at brief accident details, um, this column, um, based, since our data set is based on accidents, uh, it seems like every time an accident happened, someone wrote down or it was recorded in a system um, briefly what really took place um, when the accident happened. So was it a hit and run, um, head on collision? Some of them are very uh, summarized, but the others are very, some of them are explain quite a lot. So for this one, the vehicle locked down a pedestrian who was crossing the road. Um, for this one, a motorcycle hit an unknown MD, I don't know what that, that is, losing control and hitting the, hit the trailer. So it seems like when they were recording this, um, we didn't have actual predefined categories because in systems or in surveys and people who deal with surveys or systems or any form of data collection, um, you understand that there are questions that may have predefined choices. So for gender, maybe for this one, it was just click male, female, or other. 
right? But for accident details, there are so many things that can happen. Having choices might be difficult. There are, there are others that are very um, common, maybe like hit and run. You can leave that as a choice. But there are so many things that can happen that you can't really have all the choices. So in that case, you leave it for the one who is putting in the data to um, write what really happened. So when you're dealing with this, how then do you deal with such data? How do you um, get to a point where you can summarize such data, um, this data? Kristen, let me, let me interrupt you for a minute. We have mm -hmm. a question uh, regarding date manipulation. And um, okay. so the question is, does the date format matters? Uh, the Excel, the way the data has been entered in the Excel, does it matter when you manipulate um, the date? I, when you're manipulating the date and reading it in, I know in the Excel um, automatically detects, when you're reading in data at this point, it automatically detects the date. So I should think the date matters when you're, the, sorry, the order matters when you're trying to manipulate your date. But if it's a date variable when it's being read inside R, then you shouldn't have any problems extracting this. Yes, I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, um, Miriam, does, does she, has she answered your question? Yes, so you may proceed. Okay. So where were we? Okay. So yeah, so. As I've said, when you're dealing with a string, um, you have raw texts that you need to organize. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Like this is what you're doing today is um, just an intro of how you might deal with some things and it's very basic. But as we move forward, we will advance with more advanced techniques of dealing with strings. So um, if you're given this task and the main aim of your analysis is you want to count or you want to identify all the accidents that involve pedestrians, right? You don't want to look at hit and runs because, um, or you don't want to, no, you don't want to look at something called head on um, collision. You, you only want to look at the instances where a pedestrian was mentioned in the accident. Since we have so much text, um, a thousand rows, if you were to look at this and classify this one by one, it might be a very difficult affair to, to look at this. If you try and tabulate, let's just uh, tabulate. Um, and a DF, um, brief accident, we'll get so much, it's just so much to look at. But then um, we have actually we have a column called victim. Mm, interesting. So on this column, it shows who the actual victim was. And you can see from this point, it's very, it, come, it becomes slightly easier to identify the instances where a pedestrian is mentioned. But if you try to tabulate um, this column, we'll get uh, so many instances, at least right now they are summarized and it's a little bit better to identify. But the problem is we have these things were entered differently. So we have pedestrian, we have pedestrians, we have pedestrian, this one was misspelled, pedestrian and rider. We may need to, um, identify this, 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 and this as one thing. So then, how do we do that? We have this P pedestrian. So how do we identify all the rows, or rather all the string rows that have a pedestrian mentioned? So this is where um, we're going to introduce um, string R. Wow, today we are only going to use <laughs> packages from Tidyverse. So we have, let me just mention that we have base functions for doing everything here. And I know some of you may have um, 
interacted with base functions for dealing with strings. They are very common. I use them myself. Um, G sub and Drepon um, for you who have tried um, working with those functions. Those are fine, but today we're going to work with string functions because I think they're slightly easier to understand and to get the flow. So we'll only introduce two today, but you can as well go and explore and we can always um, have an advanced version of this um, later. So today, the first thing is we want to identify all the instances where a pedestrian is mentioned. So how do we do this? There's a function called string str underscore detect. And what it's doing is the arguments that are on str underscore detect, if you want to, sorry, let me introduce this. If you want to get um, information concerning any function, but you don't, like you just know the function, but you are not really sure sure of the argument, you use a question mark, then you start typing the function. Str underscore detect, there it is. If you hit enter, if you look at the right side, I don't know, I mean, for those who have just installed our studio it's somewhere, I don't think it's on the right, it's think up here, you'll get the documentation of this function. So all the arguments that are needed on this function, what the function does, so if you're not sure, you can always do this. So what we do here is question mark string detect and I'll get the information. What the arguments that I need are the string. This is the string column, my string column, and the pattern. Which pattern am I trying to detect? Like what am I really trying to detect? So in our case, I'm trying to detect the pedestrian. Whether or not um, a pedestrian was mentioned, uh, at any point. And then neg negate equals to false, um, I'll not use it right now. But in our case, um, if we run this, if I run uh, this, I'm highlight you can always run it from this point, as I mentioned, it will run everything in the chunk. Or since we are, we are doing it step by step, um, I'm not using this button, but I'm using a shortcut. Um, for running it, it's command enter. So if I run it, um, it has generated a column called, I've defined it as is pedestrian. And what um, essentially is returned by this function is whether it has detected this string from the column victim. So if it has detected it, we'll get a true. Otherwise, we'll get a false. So if I go to appended df, if I scroll, through this, um, the last uh, the last column we created. If I scroll through this, I know that at this point a pedestrian was mentioned. So I'm expecting a true under is underscore pedestrian. At this point, it wasn't mentioned, so I'm expecting a false. So if I scroll, I don't know if it's, it will be easy for you. I don't have to sort it fast. So if I scroll this, it's number four. A pedestrian is mentioned. If you scroll this, one, two, three, four, we have a pedestrian. Then a passenger, then a pedestrian. So, and a passenger will see false, then a pedestrian, true. So, under is underscore pedestrian, I can see all the instances that a pedestrian was mentioned. So if I wanted to know, okay, how many instances out of the total was a pedestrian like mentioned, then all I can do, it can be very easy because all I'll have to do is maybe do something like a table. Then what am I tabling? Um, appended here. What's the variable? Now um, I'm using table on this column. So now um, my focus is not on victim because on victim we have victim, we have, sorry, pedestrian P, pedestrian, pedestrian, pet, all sorts of pedestrians. So if I just click on this and hit enter, all the truths will tell me that on 452 out of 11, 18 instances, we, have, we had pedestrians mentioned or they may be involved in some way. So that's the first instance where you deal with that data, because you deal with strings, sorry. Because then, if that was my final aim, 
So I have a good sense of all the instances where a pedestrian was mentioned. And like this point where I'll have to come and just add them myself or just look for anywhere a pedestrian is mentioned because they're not mentioned the same way, it's, it's varying. So I'll have to come and add this, this, this. No. So that's like an easier way of doing it is to use string detect. Okay. Okay. So the second thing, um, uh, the second instance where we may need to manipulate strings, these are not the only two instances as I've mentioned, but the second one is sometimes um, when people are entering data, everyone, even you, when you're texting um, people and you might enter things the wrong way and that happens uh, when we have open fields for people to fill in. So you might need to find all the wrong instances where like all the instances where people entered text in the wrong way and you clean them so that you might have a chance of um, summarizing your data well. Because then if you look at county, I actually had to Google this. Uh, I wasn't sure of the number of counties we have in Kenya. But if I table county, let's just start from there. We know that the main aim is we want to do some form of summary by county. We want to know the county with the highest number of accidents, right? So a very easy and quick way of doing that might be just tabling. At this point, I'm not even using the flyer, I'm just using table. Then, um, where is county? Uh, if you scroll, or you can just start typing it, will auto complete for you. So if I click this, this is actually the way that I realized um, that some of these counties had the wrong uh, entry. So um, let me just mention that for string entries, um, it, it requires some form of background knowledge a little bit because, uh, yeah, people are entering raw text. So if you're, if you're looking at, um, data that is not quite obvious. Uh, it may require a little bit of known language as well, um, or on the areas, or on any topic that is being covered in that sense. So, for this one, it's quite obvious that Taita Taveta and Taita Taveta, same thing, right? The only difference is here we have a space separating this, and here we have a hyphen, right? And then, um, what else is they explained? They explained Wasin Gishu. So I can see Wasin Gishu and someone entered Wasin Gishu. So uh, since I know there's a county called Wasin Gishu and I know this one is the right one, so I know this one, on this instance, there was an error with the N at this point. Yeah, right? Oh yeah, true, Wasin Gishu. And then, um, Transzoia. So since I know some of the counties in Kenya, all hope, yeah. So um, if I look at Transzoia, I know it's Transzoia. I know Transzoia, uh, there was something wrong here. There was an error in entry. So if I wanted to summarize um, all the instances, like accident occurrence by county, if I do this, if I table and say, okay, in Transoya, we have seven. We don't really have seven, we have eight. It's only that this one, I don't think it's a separate thing because they're not written the same way. And this one, in this instance, we have 18 from Wasim Kishu, but R, you know, has identified, and it's only fair, these two things are two different things because this one, we have Gishu, this N, right? So in this case, what I did was, as I was actually looking for, <laughs> Um, something to clean with the text. So when I table this, I realize, okay, um, we have these instances where this uh, string, um, some instances have not been recorded uh, in the correct manner. So how do we then clean some of these things? So we have a function called string replace in Stringer. And what string replace this does sorry it's like control find find replace it's like find replace on your pc so what it does is you're telling it go and look for something called data and 
how I've identified it, I just came here and copied it because I didn't want to get it wrong. Because if you miss a space, it won't change it. It won't get to it at a better. If you put a space here, it won't do it. I'll, I'll just do it in a second so that you see. But um, what this function is doing is go to column called county, find data Taveta with a space and replace it with data Taveta with a hyphen. I'm not even sure if you have a hyphen. Anyway, so find data Taveta, replace it with this. And then for the second thing, find Wasim Gishu and replace it with Wasim Gishu. If I run this, um, and go to a no, I don't even have to, I don't want to, what do you call it? I don't want to scroll because I know there are a lot of records. So what I can do is I'll just table it again. So if I table this, uh, uh, what do we have? Sorry. Um, Ooh, it hasn't even cleaned it actually. Sorry. So, Taita Taveta hasn't been cleaned, but Wasim Gishu, sorry, has been cleaned. Because right now, we no longer have Wasim Gishu. Wasim Gishu has been cleaned. If you look at this, uh, uh, Let's just see if I got it the right way. I think I should have. And replace it with the teacher. And replace it with the teacher. So if we table this, I can look. And then what are we looking at? Count it. I don't want to change it. Oh, for some reason, it's not really cleaning it. Um, let me see if I do it one by one, if that will do the trick. I may have changed this. We remove this and just clean it a little bit as is. Let's see. Okay, let's try this. So let's see if that has done the trick. Uh, oh yeah, it has. So yeah, I think there was a problem with string replace doing many things at once. Mm, I've never really done many things at once, but it seems if we try to find replace many instances, oh, sorry, um, it doesn't pick the first one. So an easier way of doing it can be just, wow, it can be a lot of work, but if you don't have so many instances to clean, can be just do it uh, one at a time. It's even easier, it's easier to track. So Taita Taveta, and then replace it with Taita Taveta, and the chick, it has cleaned it. So yes, that's that. So these two functions can help you to clean your strings. Um, when you want to do any analysis with a column that had a string in it. So the first one, as I've mentioned, is for detecting, if you want to detect any occurrence of a given string, and the second one is like find replace in your Excel computer. If you have no, we don't have um in Excel, uh, find replace or in Word, it works in the same way. So I just created um I just created a what um an instance, a summary of county from this point. So if I summarize um, county, if my aim was I want to get the total number of accidents by county, if I run this, what this does again is sum here, I'll take appended, then group by county, 
then summarize uh, total count and just count the number of rows, the number of occurrences by county. If I browse some here, I'll have 56. Um, I didn't clean all the counties. So I'm sure you don't have 56, you have less than that. But for something like this, it may need cleaning, right? Because Homa Bay, Homa Bay, Homa Bay is just the same county for sure. We know that, but um, there was an error in data entry. And then for Kericho, Kericho, and I is missing here. For, for some of this, I didn't clean, but for the ones that I clean, they should be fine. And if my final aim was this, right? Um, you need to clean these county names before you summarize. You need to clean before you tell people, okay, Bomet has the, high of, the highest number of counties or in Geo or whatever, or in Kiambu we have 99. So you need to clean them first. And now you clean one way using uh, this string replace function before you summarize your data. So this is the end goal. This is how you get there, right? Get here, this is the path to getting here. You have to clean it. So, um, yeah, I don't know if we have any questions, but um, I will subset my data. This is my summarized data. So I've, I've summarized for every county how the number of uh, accident occurrences per county. This is what we have. I'm going to use this data for doing something else down there. So I've only ma maintained the first six um, for this reason because uh, this hasn't been cleaned and just for the sake of simplicity, simplicity, sorry, we will only maintain six rows from this data set. And this is what I'm doing here. I'm subsetting it because I only have one six rows. We we'll use this data for something else. So yes. So that is how this that is this is just an introduction to uh, string manipulation. String manipulation is very wide. Um, you can always explore how to try different instances. Um, I'll just mention something. Um, I'll not walk through it today, but there are things called regular exp expressions. Um, you can always look at it after this, but they really help when you're cleaning your string. Um, so at an advanced level for of this of data manipulation we can always um get into depth with that but for now we'll just look at this for these two functions so that's it for string manipulation um we'll not, i'll not touch on anything else but if in case you have any questions just feel free to yeah so, so up to this point, we covered appending data, which is just adding this and this to this. Um, we've covered an intro to date manipulation, which involves creating, um, extracting, just an intro of how you can extract the year, the month, the day from a given date variable. And we've also explored intro to date manipulation, which involves detecting different, um, intro to string manipulation, sorry, which involves extracting different um, string instances uh, on, your, on, your, what, on your data frame. So the next thing that we're going to do today is merging data. Um, we will have a practice, a group session at the end of this. So we only left with two things, then we have an um, interactive session where we'll get to explore some of these concepts. Uh, yeah. So um, what does merging data involve? So sometimes when you have uh, multiple data sets, sometimes data is stored in different data sets, right? So in a, for, for those of us who work with databases, you'll have something like a customer information table stored differently. So when we look at um, Safaricom database, we have one table which has one row representing every Safaricom customer with the information that demographic she's seen from Nairobi, age, 19, etc. right? And then, Another table that holds all the transactions that Christine and everyone else has ever done, right? 
So if if we wanted to to summarize um, the total number of transactions by gender, we can't do it by either data set separately because on one we have customer information, Christine, she's female 16, and then on the other data set, we have all the transactions that I need, right? So we need to combine these two data sets by a common variable. We need to merge them, and merging just involves um, combining data sets side by side. So, and when you're combining side by side, you need at least one matching column. So when you're combining Safaricom customer base um, data with how people are buying airtime and selling m -Pesa, we need something that connects the two. And that one thing can be um, my national ID number, right? Because I'm sure I don't share it with anyone. It can be when I want to analyze that data, I'll use the national ID number to merge customer information and the transactions that we have. So that will be my matching column between the two data sets, right? And merge the two data sets. That's what we mean by merging data. You're merging two data sets side by side so that you get information from both so that you're in a better position to either analyze, summarize, predict, whatever you want to do. So, so merging and joining can be used like in the same way, it's the same thing. So there, so there are different ways of merging information or merging tables. There are different joins, there are different ways of doing it. So one of the ways is um, using something called, a join called inner join. Inner join, we look at three different types of joins today. There are more than three, but we'll only focus on the three. I think, to be honest, the two, uh, the most, the merges, merge functions that I commonly use or the different sets that I use personally are just maybe two or three at most, because I don't really use the, the rest, but you may find it useful. It's not the reason why we've only focused on these three. It's for simplicity and just for the sake of this presentation. So it's okay if I can always share a link to explore different joints. Okay, so Christine, we have a question. For sure, okay. Yes, uh, to, uh, given a situation that you have several count constituencies in different counties and mm -hmm. you want to merge, uh, how can we merge the different uh, constituencies in a specific mm -hmm. county? Sorry, um, I didn't get the question. Sorry, you have yeah, different. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have. We have several constituencies in different mm -hmm. counties. How can one merge uh, the different constituencies in a specific county? For example, Kiambu County has this number of constituencies. How can we do that? So, is this like when you want to merge data sets? So, you on. Is it merging? Merge. Yes, it's it's merging, but it's not more of data sets. Is for example, you have like a variable name constituency, and uh, mm -hmm. in a given data that also has counties. So it's like placing a specific county has this number of constituencies, more of like summarizing. Oh, okay. Uh, Peter, so Peter, am I am I getting am I getting a question a question correct? Yes, yeah, I exactly how I've explained. So from what I'm getting is we have one data frame that has uh, counties and then each county has uh, different constituencies, right? Yes. So we need to, we want to merge this data with to some, some other data. <sighs> no, uh... What I understand from his question is um, the given given different constituencies, how can we summarize, given different different counties, sorry, how can we summarize like uh, the number of the constituencies per county? Let's say like Kiambu. Ah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, nice, nice, sorry. Um, thank you for clarifying that. So how you can summarize it is, um, I'll just go back again to what we are grouping by and 
um, when you're grouping by, instead of grouping by only one variable, you start by grouping two variables. So you group by county and by constituency. So um, let me just walk you through that. Let's look for something here. Uh, we'll, let's use variables from, I hope we have something that we can, okay, nice. So let's do this. Let instead of um, constituency in this case, Peter, we'll use uh, gender. So we, are, we want to get uh, the number of gender instances by county. I hope that works. So instead of constituency, because we don't have, let's use gender. So it will vary when you're summarizing data. So in this case, let me just call it sum D2. And we'll take the appended DF. And what we're saying is when I, I'm grouping by I group by county, county, and by gender. So I'm grouping by two, three, two uh, things, sorry. And then I can just use my, I can summarize, uh, do the same thing as I did before, summarize total count. Uh, equals to n, and we've said this counts the number of rows. So in this case, if I run this, uh, and I view that, I'll see it's not very clean, so just bear with the situation, but assuming my county is Baringo, and assuming this was my sub-county, but in this case, we have gender. So in Baringo, we have female, then one, right? In Baringo, again, we have male, then 14. In Baringo, M and F, then one, right? In Bomet, female one, uh, J, I don't know what J means, one, and male, 12. And, and that is how um, we can summarize, in, in terms of total count, um, based on two variables. Yeah, on, or based on a variable that can vary within another one. So based on these two, this is the summary that we'll end up with. I don't know if that answers it. Has your question been answered? Yes, let's proceed. Oh, nice, nice. Okay, sour, sour. So the next thing is, um, so we are talking about merging data and um, as I've mentioned there are different types of merging um, criteria that we can use so we will discuss three right but before we start um, I'll just take you back to the summary um, DF uh, data set that we had initially so that we don't we have it very fresh in our memory so if I look at this this is one of the data sets that we'll use and this is the data set we summarized up here so we grouped by county then total count and we had this so the number of accidents by county and we only kept six okay then right now we are creating another data frame um i created a like a dummy data frame for the population per county and the whole aim is we since we've calculated the number of accidents per county assuming we had that data set and the aim is we want to summarize the ratio of accidents relative to the population of that county so we only we already have the summary but the population data is somewhere else. Assuming you're downloading it from like a website online or open data. So in this case, we've created it. So how we are creating it, let me just go back to what Naomi taught a little bit as well. So when you're creating your county, this is a vector. So how you create a vector is county, 
then you wrap it in a sea. Then Baringo, Bomet, Embu, Nairobi. These are counties in Nairobi, actual counties. And then create another uh, vector called population. And under population, we have um, dummy values. Of course, those are not actual populations, but I've just selected a few. And then after this, how can you then create a data frame based on these two um, vectors? you use the data.frame function. So how you use it is you use it to combine the two vectors. So um, how you combine the two vectors are data.frame, first argument is, every argument actually is the vector names, so county and population. Our aim is we want to merge these two files, we want to merge this data frame with our summarized data frame, with this, with, sorry, with this, the subset. So if I run this, at this point, I, I haven't even done any merges or any joins. I've just created a data frame. So if I run this, um, I'll create a data frame. And in that data frame, it's called county statistics. If you look at the right side of my screen, we have everything that is on memory. Sorry, it's quite a lot. But the second is county statistics. And under county statistics, we have um, four observations and with two variables. And if you look at the vectors that I've just created, we have county with four observations and the population with four observations as well. So when I look at that, you'll see, um, this is my, my data frame. It only has four rows. Um, yeah. So let's go back to the joins. When you're joining data, there are different reasons why you might need to join data. You might need to join data because you need to summarize based on sorry, based on uh, the two data sets, uh, you may need to join because you need to find out how many rows are on this data set but are missing on the other one. How many IDs um, do we have on one data set but are missing on the other one? How many, if in, the, in, in the instance of Safaricom, how many customers do we have in our database that have never transacted, meaning they've never bought an airtime, air they've never, um, sent money via M-Pesa, how many do we have? That might be a need for merging. Or in another case, you need to summarize information um, from both data frames. So your aim will determine which join you need to use. So one of the joins that um, we can use is called an inner join. And what an inner join does is, when you're merging, in this case, keep in mind that X and Y are data frames, this and this. So when you're merging data frames, X and Y, and you use an inner join function, what an inner join function does is it will keep all rows that are only merged between X and Y. So if if we have county Embu in X and county uh, Embu in Y, it will merge, but it will not maintain rows that haven't merged completely. So if you have Embu in X, but Embu was missing in Y, it will not keep that row. It will not keep Embu. It will drop Embu. So in this case, let me just let's just try running an inner join of these two data sets. They are up here. So you can always view which one is missing from what. And in this case, the first one that we are merging is called an inner join. If we run this, merged DF, before you get to merge DF, when you look at county statistics, because we are merging the left one, sum DF is X, this is Y. So let me just move this. So you look at sum DF, we have Baringo, Bomet, all this. And county statistics, we have this, right? The first thing that is very easy to notice is Nairobi is missing from this. Nairobi is not here, right? Here, in this case, let's look for an Elgeo Maraquet. This one, this is Elgeo Maraquet. 
is missing from this side. So when I'm in adjoining, I'm expecting only rows that are found, only counties that are here and here that will only be, those are the only rows, sorry, that will be maintained. So when I look at merged DF, which is this, this, if I click on it, I'll only see three rows that have been maintained, Baringo, Bomet, and Embo. Looking at this, Baringo, uh, Bomet, and Embo, and this one, Baringo, Bomet, and Embo, are the only ones that have, like, are the only counties that are in both data sets. So an inner join will only keep the counties that are in both data sets, and it will drop the other rows. Please note that it's dropping row-wise. It will drop rows that are not in both data sets. The thing is, it will drop rows that are not in both data sets, but keep columns from both. Columns are this one. Columns, these are columns. So this is the matching one, definitely it has to be there. But this and this, if you notice, the total count was in this only. But population was in this. But when you merge, the only thing it has done is it has dropped rows of counties that are not in both data sets, but has kept columns from both. So that is an inner join. That is what an inner join does. That is how it works. So in the instance where you only want to keep um, uh, rows of data that are found from, that are found on both um, data sets, that is how it works. The next join, um, sorry, it's a left join. And what we have on a left join is, it's quite similar um, to an inner join. The only difference is it will keep rows that have matched rows that are counties that are in both X and Y, plus the ones that you didn't merge from X. So when you're running a left join function, it's very important for you to identify what's your X. Which data frame, like from which data frame do you want to keep all the rows? Because if you want to keep all the rows for county statistics, then county will be the X one, then sum will be here. But if I want to keep this one, all the rows from this one, plus the rows that have merged this one, I use a left join and I put this one, this data frame as the first argument. So if I run this, if I run merge DF, uh, nice, there's this uh, warning message that I wanted to highlight. Um, no, let me just run it and then I'll tell you what that means. So if I run this and look at the merge df2, so I've created another one. Let me just close this and create merge df2. You will notice that right now, all the rows from this one, this one has six rows and this is six rows. All the rows from uh, subset, some df subset have been maintained, but it has also, it has merged with county statistics. And in the instances where a county was not or is not in this data frame, it's missing, right? And that's like rightfully so because it doesn't, it doesn't have any information on population. So in this case, we've kept, kept all the counties, but um, the ones that don't have a population will have a missing on all the columns in Y. Y being county statistics. So that is a, a left join for you. Yeah. And then last one. So an inner join keeps rows that are found in both and both all columns. A left join keeps rows that are found in both plus rows that that are only found in the X. So you decide which one, which DF will be the X DF data frame. And then the last one um, that we look at today is an anti-join. And what an anti-join um, means is sometimes you don't really, you don't even want to um, like merge and get common rows to do some other stuff. I just want to know which rows are in my X but are missing in my Y, 
which counties have I summarized, but don't have, which ones are those? You may need that to maybe um, explore of ways in, in which you might get that data or share it with whoever who might help. So in this case, an antigen will be the fastest way of doing it, because then you antigen X and Y. And if I run this, uh, merged DF3, so you get Bungoma, Busia, and Elgeyo do not have county statistics. And if I look at county statistics, Bungoma is missing, Elgeyo is missing, and which other one is that? And Busia and Busi is missing as well. So we know if I were to share this information with someone, we have two data sets and you know, someone has asked you to identify which counties don't have county statistics so that we look for them. You just come here, read your data in, run an anti-join, anti-join this and this by county. You'll get all the counties that do not have county statistics. You can share this information and say Bungoma, Busi, and Elgeo do not have county statistics. That's the easiest way of, of, of doing it. So those are the three instances that we, we have talked about today um, in terms of merging data. When to keep all rows, when to keep all rows plus the rows on the left, and when to identify the rows that are on the left but missing on the right. Left is this, right is this, X is this, Y is this. So just one thing that I need to mention is um, when, you're, when you're merging data, this is warning message that I've gotten. Column county joining character vector and factor passing into character vector. So when you have two data frames, right? And one column, one, one, uh, in one data frame, county was a factor. And in another one, it was a character type. So let me just, let's just see what is going on. If I use the function class, class tells me the class of my, of my variable. Um, yeah, so if I do um, sum this and county, it's a character. If I do the same, Oh, um, no, sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. For, for this, let's see what it is. It's a factor. So this, these two variables have um, different data types. So the warning message I'm getting here is R has converted or rather this function when it's merging, it has converted the factor variable to a character. And in this case, it's fine. And I don't think it, it wouldn't really cause anything in this particular case, so it's okay. So this is the warning message that you get. When two things that you're trying to merge do not have the same type. You might try to merge using um, county, but in one, in one data frame, the county is defined as a numeric. So in that case, you might really need to explore, you know, how you can convert them to actual names. Because if you have a numeric and a character, a numeric are actual numbers, one, two, three, four, five. Even if you, it will not match this file with a character, with a character vector that has something like Mungoma, Busia, whatever, the actual names. So you may need to go back to this one of the files and clean it and clean it and match one to the county that it's supposed to be. If one is Mombasa, match it to Mombasa, two to Nairobi before you merge. So the reason why I didn't pay much attention to this is because um, I already know it wouldn't bring any issues and I have checked before this. Yeah, of course. So um, at this point, sorry, we are on the last, last thing. And then um, we have our practice session in the next few minutes. Uh, group sessions rather. So if you have any question on merging data, please feel free to ask. So, yes. We don't have any question currently. So, proceed. Nice. So, um, ah, not nice, so <laughs> just feel free to ask. 
Um, the last thing that we're looking at is reshaping data. And this is the last thing that we'll be exploring today before we move to group session. And um, just to give you a recap of what we've done so far, so we've appended data, appending rows, merging this and this, to form appended DF. We have a little bit of string manipulation, which is working with text. We have done date manipulation, just an intro, working with date. And we have merged data. Merging data is merging, um, combining two data sets side by side. That is the last thing we've done. So the final thing is reshaping data. Is when you're reshaping data. So in this instance, what reshaping data, we mean by reshaping data generally, is um, your data set might have, uh, you might need to reorganize how your data set is structured. So reorganize the rows and column, like what becomes a row and what becomes a column. You might need to switch it up a little bit. And that is what we mean by reshaping data. So for today, we'll not even read data from an external source on this point. We'll just create our own data set. Hopefully it will make it very easy for us to understand the concept of different data sets. So a data can be in long or in wide. And I'll explain what that means after this example. So first, assuming we have um, an experiment, um, for, us, for those of us who uh, may have had a chance of running experiments in their day-to-day -day or coursework or may have been even part of an experiment, um, assuming right now we are running an experiment and the experiment is, is, is aimed at helping students get better at math scores. So what we're doing is we give them a math exam, they do it, and then we, as, assuming we've said that um, giving people, what, watching a Netflix movie will somehow, um, will somehow, affect how they score math, we'll take the math score first, before and after. So the last thing at this point is, what kind of data set will we have? We create, um, when we create this data set, um, sorry, we'll have participant ID, pre and post, and then the exam score. So the participant ID is Christine, assuming Christine is one, one, pre and post pre giving them the Netflix movie to watch or whatever intervention we're giving them, giving them money or whatever. And then Mary, two and two, Lucy, three and three. So everyone will get a pre and post uh, entry. And then what's the exam score before giving the money, 22? What's the exam score after giving the money, 34? So this is how our data frame look like. Uh, so we have Christine, free, Christine post, post experiment. Lucy, free, Lucy post experiment. Faith, free, faith post experiment. This data structure is called long. Long, why? Because Christine is repeating, like not Christine, but participant information is repeating on every like row. So each row does not uniquely identify a participant. That is what we mean by long in this instance. Your rows are repeating based on some, some variable. This is long. Assuming we want to convert it to wide, a wide data frame would be a data frame where one row in our instance represents a participant and is unique to a participant. So we'd only have Christine, something that will make it pre, maybe pre-score, post-score, Mary, pre-score, post-score. So how do we shift in between these two different structures, shifting between long and wide? So um, this is where we get um, functions uh, that we use for shifting in between. So we have pivot wider and pivot longer. So 
there are, I'm sure some of you, some of us have worked with Gather and Spread. I've worked with it a lot, actually. Um, that is what I use. But I figured this is very easy. I actually discovered it just recently. Um, it's even easier to understand, even to, easier to remember um, the arguments. So if you're using Gather and Spread, that's fine. But for today, we'll be using Pivot Wider and Pivot Longer. And by pivot wider, assuming the data we have, this one, we've already said it's in long. Long because each row does not uniquely identify a participant. So everyone's uh, record is repeating, Christine, two rows, everyone, two rows. So assuming we want to reshape it to wide, where each row will represent a participant, what we will do is use this pivot wider. The first argument is the data frame, then names from. Names from is, we're trying to stretch this data set. We're trying to stretch it into wide. So we're trying to move pre to be a column. Pre, then the score will be under pre. Post will be here, then the score will, under, will be under post. So on names from will be the experiment stage and values from what will be the values under the experiment stage will be the exam score so if i run this reshape data two looking at it you realize now the structure has changed now we are on wide why are we on wide because now every row represents a participant right this is this was our long christine christine pre-post this is our wide Christine, pre, what is the value? Post, what is the value? So these are the two different structures that exist. So um, the last thing is, if we want to reshape it back to being long, so we are on wide, reshape data, we are on wide. How about when we want to reshape it back to um, long, what would we do? We'd go to, um, We'd create an object, I'll give it a different name, but use a function called pivot longer. It's even, I think, easier to remember. Pivot longer, you want to change it to long, so use pivot longer. And the first argument in this case is the data frame that you want to reshape, which is reshaped to, the one that we just reshaped. And the second argument is at this point, we need to identify, we need to tell R or, yeah, like which columns do you want to reshape to long? Which columns are being shifted? Which columns are shifting from this to this, to here? And which ones are remaining here? So if you don't mention participant ID, it's a constant. That one is not moving, but pre and post are, are changing the format. So we'll tell R, we are using variables from pre to post, and then, what name will we give to the, the shifted variables? Like, what will, name will we give to pre? Because pre will come here, post will come here. Pre here, post here. So what name will we give to this column? And what name will we give to the values? Because when pre comes here, the value will be here. Post here, the value will be here. So those are the arguments. Name to and values too. Please note that at this instance, we have a quote. Um, the names are um, named as are what are highlighted using quotes. So if I run this, reshape three, you'll notice that we are back to long. So experiment stage. Um, is the column now. It now houses pre and post, and the exam score is the one that houses all these actual values. And you'll notice that now we are back to where we came from. So yeah, so that's it when it comes to reshaping data, when you're working with data, there's so many instances where you might need to reshape it. Um, different functions in R, like statistic functions or regressions or like even ggplot2, depending on the function that you want to use, it may require data to be in a certain way. 
So playing around with data and the structure is what we call reshaping. Shifting from long to wide is what we call um, reshaping data. So that's it for reshaping data. Um, and that's it really for the training up to today. I know it may be a lot, but um, these are very useful techniques and things to think about when you're cleaning data, when you're trying to play around with data to come up with a final product. So I'll stop at that point. Um, in case we have any question, um, feel free to ask. But then again, um, yeah, we need to shift to yeah group exercises, which should be the next thing. So the exercises will be just a practice of what we've learned today. So yeah, we'll I think uh, Lucy or Faith will give us an explanation of how we move forward. But the next thing is we're going to move into groups. And um, I've just shared a few questions that will help us to, to practice the things that we've learned today. There are not so many. So um, they're just concepts on reading data and appending and everything that we've done today, playing with dates, uh, playing with a, a string, and then reshaping data. So that is what we're going to do right now. And in case there are questions that I may not answer right now, I'll answer just before I can be close for, for today. So yeah, that's it for the training today. Uh, um, Christy, thanks so yeah. much for this insightful, informative tutorial on manipulating data as well. Yeah, uh, so we'll, be, we'll break out into different groups. Faith will, will direct us into the groups that will do that. Yeah, so for the practical sessions, we'll have different leads. We'll have, uh, we'll have Faith, um, Shelmeth, and also Kelvin, Kelvinson. We'll also be part of the, the teaching assistant, rather. <laughs> yeah, so Faith, please go right ahead and uh, group us into the different uh, breakout groups.
set working directory. Um, set it on the chunk that you've just left out there, up there, the setup chunk. Okay. I don't understand the data frame. Okay. So, uh, so you've already uh, binded the appended the two, and uh, yeah. your concern is how to to convert it uh, from uh, right to wrong. Yes, I have um, one, two, three, four, five, seven columns. The first one is um, like the ID. Okay. Do you mind sharing your screen, please? Yes. Okay. And what kind of data do you people deal with? Uh, DHIS data, demographics, uh, risk factors, things like that. COVID data, yeah. Uh, just a minute. Sorry, I just got distracted. Just a minute. So, oh, so I wanted to tell you, I think once you have that data, what have you been using for analysis so far? Uh, Stata. Okay. So I think for you, the best thing to do is um, think of things you've been doing in Stata and think of how to do them in R. That way, it's going to be an easy transition for you. Because let me tell you, the materials, there's a time we used to we used to complain how materials, like how materials online to teach us some of these mm -hmm. things. Right now, they come more to sana and it's very overwhelming. Um, sure. So what I will just advise you is think of something you do in Stata and um, think of how to do it in R. There's a time I was working for some company and they were using Stata and that's how those who are... When we view the county stats, we have the dates and uh, um, county. Okay, so we we can then proceed with then how we we have been taught to date. So we we are we are we are making it yeah from long from want to long. Okay, so how do we do from wide to long? From today's tutorial, we use the pivot. Pivot, pivot long. Okay, so and and I'm thinking. Uh, you... So, uh, I think the argument that uh, um, your first argument is uh, all right because it's the name of uh, the data that you want to change. Then you need to specify, uh, the second argument should be, you need to specify which columns do you want to change uh, to wrong and which ones should remain. So I think uh, the, only, the only columns that we need to change to wrong are the, the three dates. So the second argument should be uh, 41109 to 44, oh, okay. yeah. And do I have to put it between uh, breaks be, be, between this one, like for here? Yes, you can see us, or I can see it. Uh, so the next uh, thing was, yeah. so you need to read sheet one.
to we need to and maybe and mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah i was saying maybe uh, the shortcut that i'm using to insert a chunk is control alt i in in windows I think oh. for mac is command <laughs> command alt i oh nice yes. Nice. That's new. Command Alt. I have to Okay. Thank you. Um, Maureen, hi. Okay. Cyrus, can you hear me? Cyrus? Okay. Um, can't hear. Eto, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear. I don't know why. Um, well, um, the, um, I think everyone. I think they are muted. Just continue. Ah. Oh, okay. Can they unmute themselves? It's okay, just continue. Okay. Okay. Um Peter or David. Yeah. Who wants to uh, tell us how we'll append the the two? Tina, I'm here. Wait. Sorry. So, uh, how is the progress? Do we have any other concerns? Has everyone uh, been able to uh, to read the shared data there are to things in R mm -hmm. and. Uh, from the session, I think uh, the two borrow a lot from each other. Mm -hmm. Like uh, for the joints, inner joints, the inner joint, left outer joint, it's just uh, the difference in. Yeah, and then we can we can instruct like the right. Hi Lucy, how's it going? Going on well. Uh, how many more minutes do you guys need? Um, we're doing our second, so we have that's so like five to ten minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, sorry. I. Uh, you need to pipe the last one. Do you want us to yeah. check or maybe you can? Okay. Hi, um, everyone. Uh, how many minutes? Hi. How many more minutes do you need to finish your exercise? Are you done? No, no, no. We are halfway through. Okay. I think, uh, okay. So by okay. 10, try to... you'll be done. Ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. By what? One ten. One ten. Yeah. Sour. Okay. Sour. Okay. On sheet two, then I've I've gone forward and appended. Uh, I think we are seeing a an, uh, another screen. Because it's oh. empty. I, I don't know if you're typing or. Okay. Hi, Kevin, Son, and everyone. Uh, how many more Hi. minutes do you need to finish the exercise? We've, we've just started. Uh, maybe 10 minutes will do. Okay. Now I can see. Okay. So I've uh, set the directory. 
Through that, the libraries then
Hi, so how are you guys done? Hello, as our group, we Maliza at Kitambo. The date column, you can use Excel and coding, so yeah. you need to figure it out first. That's the last thing. Okay, okay. Yep. Hi, guys. Um, sorry, sorry, guys. Hi, really sorry, but we have to go back to the main session. Um, so we are using a Zoom link of Our Ladies Global, and our time slot is ending in the next five minutes. So we really need to go oh, back. Oh, gosh. And mm -hmm. I'm really sorry, but uh, feel free to exchange contacts and continue this on social media and personal levels. Sorry. Uh, it's okay, thank you. And, uh, hi, guys. Oh, do you have... Hi, hi, everyone. Um, I'm sorry, but uh, I have to take you back to the main session. Uh, okay, it's all right. Yeah, I, I hope you had a, a good discussion and feel free to share your social media handles and you can pick it up later. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your explanation. Okay, thank you. The time has design out. Thanks. Okay. Hi, everyone is back now. Uh, we're just going to be waiting for the others. Um, um, maybe Shell, you can just Shell, you can two minutes to talk about you's R, then R. we can close the meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Shell Myth. Um, I'm here to, first of all, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm here to talk about the user um, conference that will be happening next year. I'm not sure when, but um, it's going to be virtual. So this time um, the conference has, like the organizers have tried to make it very inclusive such that they have some of us as organizers. Um, and we are trying our best, especially those in Africa, we are trying our best to give people in our continent um, a chance to present their work um, at user. So I'm sharing a LinkedIn page um, on the chat. So please follow us. Um, and if you think you have something interesting that you will want to present to R, you can reach out to me um, directly on Twitter if you have my contact. So that's the LinkedIn page. We thought of coming up with the LinkedIn page because most of us are on LinkedIn, especially in Africa. Um, oops. Most of us, sorry, most of us use um, LinkedIn, but the R community is majorly on Twitter. But then we are also trying to grow the LinkedIn community. So if you're not a Twitter person, you can follow the page on LinkedIn. But um, if you are, I'm also posting a link to the Twitter page. So everything that will be posted on Twitter will also be posted on LinkedIn. Um, we are going to use this to make announcements um, I don't know, as we prepare for the conference, which is going to be held next year tentatively in June, you can just look at the page and see um, the different things we are going to be posting. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shelmet, for that. Uh, Lucy, thank you everyone for joining. Totally glad to to have your company and i hope we will learn something um so i think on your screen you can see our next meetup uh it's going to be text men in r by shelmet macharia she is a data scientist at ajua and uh, it's on 7th november from 11 to 1 please try to keep time uh please reserve uh, on our meetup page uh talk to us via twitter and linkedin in case you have any problems or any questions and feel free to leave your feedback um uh, 
through our Twitter, LinkedIn, email, or even Meetup. Just contact us in case you have questions. In case you have suggestions and feedback, uh, you're very welcome. And also in case you, you want to present uh, one, in one of our meetups, feel free to just contact us and we are going to discuss it with you further. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much for joining. Uh, thank you for your company. Please um, tell more people of how good these sessions are uh, in case they want to mo know more about R. And thank you, thank you so much, Christine, for such an informative session and the detailed sessions that we had. Uh, we really, we really love that. And I've seen the feedback from the chat and people really loved um, uh, your explanations and the details and everything that you have taught us today. So thank you so much, Christine. Thank you so much for everyone who joined and uh, have a nice uh, weekend um, and see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Oh, thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank Have you. a lovely weekend ahead. Nice weekend, guys. Bye. Okay.